says the key is getting it to girls before they're exposed to HPV. So these would be young girls, um, probably around the age of 9 or 10, who have not become sexually active. If used correctly, experts say this new vaccine could save some 3,500 lives a year in the U.S. alone, and it could prevent 70% of cervical cancer cases worldwide which means millions of women could avoid the treatments that Shannon Arvizu has been through. The 28-year-old was diagnosed with cervical cancer last year. So if this vaccine had been available you know, just a few years ago, this whole um, process could have been avoided. Researchers say Gardasil will not end cervical cancer, but it definitely brings us much closer to that goal. Dr. Sean Kinev, CBS News.
And AIDS is a progression of the effects of the human immunodeficiency virus. So HIV is human immunodeficiency, so immunodeficiency virus. You can have HIV and not have AIDS. A lot of people now are infected with HIV, but their immune system is keeping it in check or the medications that they're on are keeping them in check. And they haven't progressed to AIDS. AIDS is sort of a end stage collection of a lot of other problems that result from the inability of your immune system to handle this HIV virus. So you've probably heard of Kaposi sarcomas and I forget all the names, but you have white spots, you got black spots, purple spots on your skin, you've got, um, you get white, you get thrush, which is a white coating in your throat. So a whole lot of other secondary problems that come into play when your immune system is unable to effectively handle this HIV. So autoimmune. This auto means self. It means your immune system is attacking yourself, not something that is foreign, like a bacteria or a virus, but it's attacking your own tissue. So the category includes a lot of different diseases. MS is multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis, we had arterial sclerosis, which was hardening of the arteries. We've got multiple sclerosis. This is where the immune system attacks the myelin on your nerves. So it demyelinates. And it progresses and then it goes into remission. It progresses and it goes into remission. So people will have symptoms of neurological problems because their the action potentials don't travel as fast when the nerve is demyelinated. But then when the Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes remyelinate, then the symptoms go away. But something usually causes them to come back again. So exacerbation and remission is typical in MS. RA is rheumatoid arthritis. This implies inflammation. It 
it's not anything to do with red blood cells, but you get a red rash sometimes on the face when you have this systemic lupus erythematosus. This is an autoimmune attack on various tissues. It affects the joints, it affects the kidneys, it affects other organs, it primarily uh, it affects the nervous system. Primarily kidneys is what I think is the most severe problem in systemic lupus erythematosus. There's also discoid lupus, which is pretty much restricted to the skin and sometimes joints. But systemic lupus is a very severe disease that affects the kidneys and the kidneys can shut down. Type 1 diabetes, the autoimmune attack is on the pancreas and beta cells start stop producing insulin. So you then need to inject the insulin. Psoriasis is autoimmune attack on the skin. The skin becomes very scaly, rough, and tends to crack, and then can bleed in severe cases. It's cosmetically very awful for the person who has it because they have all these rough, scaly red patches on their skin. It's uncomfortable to have it, and some people, they look at the patches and go, oh my god, they must be contagious, and they kind of shy away from them. The worst thing is for the person, it's not contagious to you, you're not going to get it. This is an autoimmune disease, it's not transmissible. You're not going to catch MS from somebody, you're not going to catch rheumatoid arthritis from somebody, you're not going to catch diabetes myelitis from somebody. This is their problem. You should just feel sorry for them or whatever, but don't shy away from them. Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Graves' disease. We talked about Graves' disease last semester. This was autoimmune um, that uh, antibody that binds to the TSH receptor and causes your thyroid gland to overproduce the thyroid hormone. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is autoimmune attack of the thyroid gland and invasion of white blood cells into the thyroid gland. And now the thyroid gland doesn't function. It Graves' disease it overproduces and you're hyperthyroid. With Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you are hypothyroid because the immune system has damaged the secretory cells. Those are examples of autoimmune disease. Now they say that this, I mean, by definition it means it's attack, attacking your own normal cells. And your immune system is supposed to recognize normal cell, cells. So they debated for a long period of time. Does the immune system now suddenly after all the training that thymus gave these T-cells, suddenly these T-cells are malfunctioning? Or did the thymus let out some T-cells that weren't reacting to self-antigens, but potentially could, and then something set them off? And now they're pretty much coming around to my theory in 1987 that Something is binding to the surface of the cell and making the cell look abnormal. It could be an antibody. It could be something, it could be an antigen-antibody complex that gets stuck on the surface of your cell and then your immune system says, hey, that's been invaded. But it hasn't been invaded, it just has something stuck on the surface. And then the T cells react. There are a lot of cells that are very, a lot of tissues that are porous enough, like your joint tissues, where these antigen antibody complexes could get stuck and then cause an autoimmune attack. So that's the current theory. I kind of feel proud of myself that I thought about it as a rest. <laughs> Uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, uh, thyroid, I guess. I guess. That's hypothyroid. Eh? It's 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 really it's really it's really it's really
Allergies. How many have allergies? You still not have, and now you have. Me too. <laughs> a lot of people never had anything they reacted to, and then they get to a certain age, and all of a sudden, I've got allergies. Where did that come from? So, by definition, these are two harmless things in your environment. For the majority of the people, how many of you are allergic to peanuts? Zero. <laughs> yeah. Why is it so common now for younger kids? Well, like our generation doesn't have it. Why is it getting more common for older people too? Oh. Okay, so why, uh, one of the hypotheses as to why allergies are more prevalent now is that your, when the, the T cells that are part of the response were not respond not presented with pathogens at the correct time that then they could react to. So they kind of pent up all their responses and I, I want to react to something. This is my acting out to remember it. It's like, hey, I'm supposed to be reacting to things. And I'm not. Okay, well there's something. I'm going to yeah. react to that. <laughs> and so they actually looked at kids who were allowed to go outside and play in the dirt. Not eat dirt per se, but you know, they, they, if they're playing in it, sometimes they consume it as well. Kids tend to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, mud pies don't taste as good as they look. But then they experience these pathogens that are out there. And the T cells react to the minor inoculation. And they're happy because they had something to react to. And then they looked at a population of kids who were essentially living in a sterile environment because mommy washed them up and down when they, before they went out, came back in, and the house was Clorox all over the place or antibacterial everywhere. And so they never had any, their T cells never had anything to react to. And they found there were many more allergies in kids who had clean households. And when the mom was a little sloppy, not pigsty, not hoarding kind of thing, no rats and all that in the house, but just, you know, she didn't wipe every counter down. And the kids were allowed to experience their environment in a natural way. Then they had less allergies. So that's one theory, but maybe there's other reasons too. But it certainly explains why all of a sudden older people suddenly become reactive. And thinking back, my household tended to be wiped down pretty clean. When I ask around, but mine is because I moved to Maryland and from New York and just you know, I was picking up hard. Mm -hmm. I think it's the the pollen. Pollen. Maybe the you you would have been sensitive to it in New York, but there wasn't any. There wasn't. Yeah, that could be it too. Okay, so harmless substances, now you're reacting to it. Two ways your immune system reacts, either immediately, and they call that immediate hypersensitivity. So you're, it's a normal thing, and you're sensitive to it, but the majority of the population is not. So you're hypersensitive to this substance. And that involves the IgE antibody that is produced by the B cell, but tends to be on the surface of mast cells. So mast cells have it, and then whatever harmless thing that comes in binds to that antibody on the surface of the mast cell, and then degranulates. The mast cell releases its chemical grant from its granules. If you have a severe reaction to it, some people are minorly <coughs> reactive, maybe coming in contact with this allergen several times, and then they get stronger and stronger reaction to it until they get something that's called anaphylaxis. And other people, the first time they come in contact with it, they are so hypersensitive they get anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis
sepsis is where you get histamine released into the, the system and then your blood, your blood vessels become so leaky that fluids just shift out into your tissue and your tissues swell. If the tissues are in your airways, then your airways close down. It also stimulates smooth muscle contraction, histamine does, and that then causes the airways to close down even further because the smooth muscle is contracting. If the fluid goes out of your vascular system really fast and in large volumes, then your blood pressure drops and you have circulatory shock. So that could be lethal. If your airways constrict and you can't get oxygen in and in and out, that is also lethal. You essentially suffocate to death. So people who have severe allergies, they'll carry an epinephrine pen. So the epinephrine, you inject it, and it dilates the airways and counteracts the smooth muscle constriction. Air gets back in. It's not going to do what well, it's. Um, it may help to shift fluids out of your, from your skin back into your systemic circulation, from your GI system into your systemic circulation, get your blood pressure back up as well. But if you got massive histamine release, you're just buying time till you can counteract that fluid shift. Delayed hypersensitivity reactions, those, as the term implies, you're hypersensitive, but you're not going to respond to that allergen for a day or two or three. And then suddenly, wham, you've got problems. So a hay fever, um, no, hay fever is immediate hypersensitivity. Um, poison ivy, we don't have that here. But what else do we have here that's... I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But these are involving T cells. And T cells will have to be activated and they have to come into the tissue and then do their damage. So you're going to, in the area where you have come in contact with this allergen, you're going to have a redness. You're going to have a bumpy, kind of granular feel to the skin. And that's all signs of the, or to the airway, but you can't feel that. So usually I'm talking about skin, because that's where you actually can see the reaction. So the bumpiness is the invasion of the white blood cells. So they become, the tissue becomes granular because of all these white blood cells in the area. So here's what your book is presenting as the sequence of events. You've got some allergen out here, and there are different color coatings, red, blue, and green. And you've got different B cells with different receptors. The ones that find the allergen then will become plasma cells. And so they will produce specific antibodies to that specific antigen. Those antibodies then can bind to the surface of your mast cells. Then the mast cell can respond to those same allergens by cross-linking. It doesn't show cross-linking, but I believe that's still, uh, you have to get enough of the receptors on the surface that an antigen can bind to two surface receptors at the same time and then the mast cell will start to release its system. And the reaction in this case is a sneeze, which, yeah, that's part of an and an allergy is you tend to have sneezing, but sometimes it's also coughing, and sometimes it's fluid collecting in the airways. And uh, redness in the skin, 
other types of signs of immediate hypersensitivity. So here we've got a table summarizing the timing difference. So immediate hypersensitivity, you're responding within the first 20 minutes of exposure to that allergen. You're starting to cough, you're starting to sneeze, you're starting to see some type of response. The antibody, um, this is an antibody-mediated response. The B cells are involved. They're producing IgEs that are binding to the surface of the mast cells, and then and also base cells. And these both have in their granules the histamine that will cause the fluids to leak out of blood vessels, and also heparin, which is to keep the blood flowing so fluids can continue to leak out of the blood vessels. They are also releasing something called slow reactive substance of anaphylaxis. The more you have of that, the more likely you're going to have an anaphylactic response, which is like threatening and has to be treated immediately with the EpiPen. Then a person who has less of that. So abbreviated, you might see that acronym in the literature. SRS-A for slow reactive substance of anaphylaxis. So that's requiring EpiPen. And then also eosinophil chemotactic factor. So eosinophils can be phagocytic, but they can also get cross-linked by antigens, and then they can release their chemicals as well. So hay fever, asthma, hives, and anything that causes extreme anaphylactic shock. Peanuts do that. Uh, shellfish can do that. Um, these things, these things usually, you, if you get read, um, stung by bees, you either develop a tolerance to it, or you become even more sensitive to it, and with one more bee sting, you could go into anaphylactic shock. The people who develop the insensitivity to the bee sting venom, usually they become beekeepers. And then definitely the people who have uh, increased sensitivity to it, they're going to stay as far away from bees as possible. Delayed hypersensitivity is going to take one to three days for the problem to show up. So, the, some like poison ivy, that's what I could remember, but we don't have it here. Some cosmetics, you'll use them for several days and all of a sudden you'll have welts all over your face and you don't know why, but it's because of the makeup. Household cleansing agents, if you don't use the proper covering for your hands, you clean the bathroom with something three times and all of a sudden your, your hands are all red and raw and swollen. But the first day, the first exposure, no problem. But you clean it three days in a row and you've had time for your T-cells to get activated and come into your tissues. Plus you're still um, using that without not protecting your hands, then you'll have a full-on hypersensitive reaction. Some things that you come in contact with will cause a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. When I was working with my rats, if they scratched me just inadvertently, this little nail scratch, the, the fecal matter, I guess, or the dander that they inoculated me with, it didn't cause a reaction today, but two days later, then that area would get all granulated and sore and red. So, had a hypersensitivity, delayed hypersensitivity to that. All right, neuroendocrine, immune response. If you need to have an email this to you or post it, I will be happy to do so. This is a new field of research. The immune system and the nervous system 
talk to each other. A lot of the stimulating factors for the endocrine system stimulate the nervous system and the immune system, ACTH, TRH. Those kinds of things, cortisol is, is a very powerful suppressor of the immune system. So they're starting to look at the interplay. And not fully understood, so start off with that. They don't, they just started looking into these interrelationships. An uh, interesting experiment with mice was they sort of like Pavlov dog, Pavlov's dog experiment. Pavlov presented food into the mouth of the dog and then rang a bell. And so when the dog was salivating, he linked the presence of food and salivation to the bell ringing. And pretty soon he didn't have to put the food in the mouth, he'd ring the bell and they'd salivate as though the food was present. So I guess somebody knew about Pavlov's experiment and said, well, let's try it with the immune system and see if we can get something that shouldn't trigger any alteration in the immune system to trigger um, the immune chain. So they, what they did was, again, it's associative learning. They took an immunosuppressive drug and paired it with the smell of camphor. Camphor is mothballs. If you've ever smelled mothballs, yeah, never forget the smell of mothballs. It's very strong smell. Even though the mothball's not there, if it's come in contact with your clothes or the fumes from the mothballs have come in contact with your clothes, they smell the moth, that camphor for a long period of time. So they paired the order of camphor with this immunosuppressive drug and presented it to the mice several times. And then they presented a placebo and were actually no immunosuppressive drug, but just the smell of camphor, and the mice suppressed their own immune system. No immunosuppressive drug, the mice suppressed their own immune system. So kind of freaky that you can make an um, animal do that. There, so that was one way to see how you could get the mind to understand an association between immunosuppression and smell of camphor and actually elicit the immunosuppression with this presentation of smell of cancer. There are also other things that are related to mind and immune system. You have psychosomatic disorders. They used to say that people were crazy who had psychosomatic disorder. No, the, psych, the, the central nervous system will change the chemicals it releases based on what you perceive as something that's harmful to you. And you can actually physically make yourself sick. So you are creating the symptoms of an illness not because you actually have a bacteria or a virus infection or any other kind of physical problem, but the chemicals released from your brain are causing the, those problems. The opposite is placebo effect. You give somebody something and you tell them, this is going to be good for you, you have an illness and this is the medication that is going to make you better, but all you do is give them a sugar tablet and their mind, believing that this is going to be helpful, will secrete other chemicals that will actually make them better. And diseases have gone away. This is a, there's a whole bunch of things on the market that have these placebo effects. Once you get somebody to perceive that that is good with your advertising, and they take it and they get a good response to it, then they go out and tell their friend, use that because I got so much better with, by drinking that tea or taking that noni or whatever. And it's the mind's effect. 
visualization. People with chronic pain, they're taught to visualize either the pain leaving their body or they, they visualize that they're in a pleasant place with no stress and that decrease in the stress in your body then helps to take your pain away. So ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, prolactin, corticotropin releasing hormone, all of these are released by lymphocytes. So why are your white blood cells releasing those? Obviously, you must be wanting to have some effect on your endocrine system. Your endocrine system has feedback to your nervous system. ACTH releases cortisol. Cortisol is a powerful immunosuppressant. If you're taking exogenous cortisol, maybe for rheumatoid arthritis, you oftentimes get sicker. Also use it for multiple sclerosis and auto uh, systemic lupus to suppress the immune system's attack on your tissues. But that also means that the immune system can't attack invading pathogens. So they tend to get more bacterial infections, more viral infections. Listen to the ads for medications for these autoimmune diseases. And uh, usually the second thing out of them, their mouth is you may get more infections. But this P is, we're going to learn about that in the gastrointestinal system. It also is um, released in the brain and it will cross-link IgE on mast cells and release histamine. Sympathetic nervous system stimulates antibody synthesis, also stimulates cytotoxic T cell production. So exactly how it does that, don't know, but when somebody has an uh, increase in their sympathetic immune um, output, I'm sorry, yeah, sympathetic immune system output, so fight or flight, so that kind of stress can increase antibody synthesis cytotoxic T cell production. So fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system. Chronic stress, cortisol. So fight or flight, if you have too many antibodies, it might lead to problems, but it might make your immune system more efficient. Cytotoxic T cells could be making the immune system Increasing that activity, increasing those numbers, could make your immune system better at handling invading pathogens. But if they're inappropriately turned on, it might make an autoimmune disease worse. Cortisol, if you remember, in the endocrine system, if you've got cortisol and epinephrine from fight or flight and glucagon, you're going to have huge increases in blood glucose concentration. That's a normal response for fight or flight, but if it's abnormally high because of chronic stress, then you could actually have pre-diabetic problems. Okay, so no sense for about five minutes. So I'm not going to 